Chapter 17 of Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Souvestre. Translated by Cranston Metcalf. Chapter 17 At the St. Anthony's Pig. Pay for a drink and I'll listen to you, said Hogshead Geoffrey to his sister. After numerous visits to the many bars and drinking saloons that surrounded the markets, they had finally gone for a late supper into the St. Anthony's Pig, the most popular tavern in the neighborhood, Geoffrey having reconciled himself to waiting for the result of the examination, which would not be announced until the following day. A new and original attraction had been stationed outside the St. Anthony's Pig for the last few days. After the formal inquiries succeeding his discovery of the drowned body in the river, Bouzia had come to Paris to see the Eiffel Tower. He had met with but a week's delay in his itinerary, having been locked up for that time in Orleans for some trifling misdemeanor. On entering the capital, Bouzia's extraordinarily equipage had caused quite a sensation, and as the worthy fellow, with utter disregard of the heavy traffic in the city, had careered about in it through the most crowded streets, he had very soon been run in and taken to the nearest lockup. His train had been confiscated for forty-eight hours, but as there was nothing really to be objected against the tramp, he had merely been requested to make himself scarce and not to do it again. Bazia did not quite know what to make of it all, but while he was towing his two carriages behind his tricycle towards the Champ de Mar, from which point he would at last be able to contemplate the Eiffel Tower, he had fallen in with the editor of the Auto, to whom, in exchange for a bottle of wine at the next café, he had ingeniously confided his story. A sensational article about the globe-trotting tramp appeared in the next number of that famous sporting journal, and Bouzia woke to find himself famous. The next thing that happened was that François Bourbon, the proprietor of the St. Anthony's Pig, shrewdly foreseeing that this original character, with his remarkable equipage, would furnish a singular attraction, engaged him to station himself outside the establishment from eleven to three every night, in return for his board and lodging, and a salary of five francs a day. It need not be said that Bouzia had closed with the offer, but getting tired of cooling his heels on the doorstep, he had gradually taken to leaving his train on the pavement and himself going down into the basement hall, where he generously returned his five francs every night to the proprietor in exchange for potations to that amount. In the basement of the St. Anthony's Pig, the atmosphere was steadily getting cloudier, and the noise louder. The time was about a quarter to two. The swells and the young men about town who went to have a bowl of onion soup at the popular café, because that was the latest correct thing to do, had withdrawn. The few pale and shabby dancers had given their show, and in another ten minutes, when the wealthy customers had departed, the supper room would resume its natural appearance, and everybody would be at home. François Bourbon had just escorted the last toffs up the narrow corkscrew staircase that led from the basement to the ground floor, and now he stood, his stout person entirely filling the only exit, unctuously suggesting that perhaps somebody would like to give an order for a hot wine salad. Berta was sitting in a corner beside her brother, whom the warmth of the room and his numerous potations had rendered drowsy, and thinking in an opportune moment to tell him of her scheme, before he became talkative or quarrelsome, she began to explain. There's nothing much to do, but I want a strong man like you. Any barrels to roll anywhere? he inquired in a thick voice. Bertha shook her head, her glance meanwhile resting mechanically on a small young man with a budding beard and a pale face, who had just taken a seat opposite her and was timidly ordering a portion of sauerkraut. I want some bars removed from a window. They are iron bars set in stone. But the stone is worn and the bars are very rusty, and anybody with a little strength could wrench them out. And that's all? Geoffrey inquired suspiciously. Yes, that's all. Then I shall be very glad to help you. I suppose it will be worth something, won't it? He broke off short, noticing that a man sitting close by seemed to be listening attentively to the conversation. Berta followed his eyes, and then turned with a smile to her brother. That's all right, don't mind. I know that man. 
and in proof of the statement, she held out a friendly hand to the individual who seemed to be spying upon them. Good evening again, Monsieur Julio. How are you since I saw you just now? I did not notice you were here. Julio shook hands with her, and without evincing any further interest in her, went on with the conversation he was having with his own companion, a clean-shaven fellow. Go on, Billy Tom. Tell me what has happened. Well, there has been the devil to pay at the royal palace, owing to that accident, you know. Of course, I was not mixed up in it in any way. I'm only interpreter, and I stick to my own job. But three weeks after the affair, Mueller was suddenly kicked out, owing to the door having been opened for the chap who worked the robbery. Mueller? Mueller, said Julliot, seeming to be searching his memory. Who is Mueller? Why, the watchman on the second floor. Oh, ah, uh, yes, and who turned him out? I think his name is Juve. Oh, ho, Julliot muttered to himself. I thought as much. There was a noise at the entrance of the hall, and down the corkscrew staircase came two people who, judging by the greeting they received, were very popular. Ernestine, a well-known figure, and Mealy Benoit, who was very drunk. Benoit lurched from one table to another, leaning on every head and pair of shoulders that came into his way, and reached an empty seat on a lounge into which he crushed, half-squashing the pale young man with the budding beard. The lad made no protest, seeming to be afraid of his neighbor's bulk, but merely wriggled sideways, and tried to give the newcomer all the room he wanted. Benoit did not seem even to notice the humble little fellow, but Ernestine took pity on him, and assured him that she would look after him. All right, Sonny, she said. Mealy won't squash you, and if he tries any of his games on you, Ernestine will look after you. She took his head between her two hands and kissed his forehead affectionately, ignoring Mealy Benoit's angry protests. He's a dear little chap. I like him, she said to the company at large. What's your name, dearie? The boy blushed to the tips of his ears. Paul, he muttered. But Francois Bourbon, the proprietor, with his usual keen eye to business, arrived just then and set down before Mealy Benoit the famous hot wine salad of which he had spoken before. Behind Bourbon came Bozia, who had left his turnout on the pavement and come down into the supper room to eat and drink his five francs, and more if credit could be got. Benoit caught sight of Hogshead Geoffrey and immediately offered to clink glasses with him. He pushed a glass toward him, inviting him to dip it with the rest into the steaming bowl. But Geoffrey was warming up under the influence of alcohol, and broke into a sudden flame of wrath at sight of Mealy Benoit. If Benoit should be given the first place, it would be a most rank injustice, he reflected, for he, Geoffrey, was most certainly the stronger man. And besides, the sturdy hogshead was beginning to wonder whether his rival might not have devised an odious plot against him and put the famous piece of orange peel upon the track, but for which Geoffrey would have won hands down. So Geoffrey, very drunk, offered Benoit, who was no whit more sober, the gross affront of refusing to clink glasses with him. "'Why, it's you!' exclaimed Buzia, in ringing tones of such glad surprise that everybody turned round to see whom he was addressing." Julio and Berta looked with the rest. "'Why, it's the green man of just now,' said the asylum nurse to her companion, and he assented moodily enough. "'Yes, it's him, all right.' Buzia took no notice of the attention he had provoked, and did not seem to notice that the green man appeared to be anything but pleased at having been recognized. "'I've seen you before, I know,' he went on. "'Where have I met you?' The green man did not answer. He affected to be engrossed in a most serious conversation with a friend he had brought with him into the supper room, a shabby individual who carried a guitar. But Bazia was not to be put off, and suddenly he exclaimed, with perfect indifference to what his neighbors might think, I know you are the tramp who was arrested with me down there in Lot, the day of the murder, you know, the murder of the Marquise de Langrun. Bazia, in his excitement, had caught the green man by the sleeve but the green man impatiently shook him off, growling angrily, Well, and what about it? For some minutes now, Hogshead Geoffrey and Mealy Benoit had been exchanging threatening glances. Geoffrey had given voice to his suspicions, 
and kind friends had not failed to report his words to Benoit. Inflamed with drink as they were, the two men were bound to come to blows before too long, and a dull murmur ran through the room, heralding the approaching altercation. Berta, anxious on her brother's behalf, and a little frightened on her own, did all she could to induce Geoffrey to come away, but even though she promised to pay for any number of drinks elsewhere, he refused to budge from the bench where he was sitting hunched up in a corner. When at length he had got rid of Buzia and his exasperating garrulity, the green man resumed his conversation with his friend with the guitar. "'It's rather odd that he hasn't a trace of accent,' the latter remarked. "'Oh, it's nothing for a fellow like Gurn to speak French like a Frenchman,' said the green man in a low tone. Then he stopped nervously. Ernestine was walking about among the company, chatting to one another and getting drinks, and he fancied that she was listening to what he said. But another duologue rose audible in another part of the room. "'If the gentleman would like to show his strength, there's someone ready to take him on.' Hogshead Geoffrey had thrown down his glove. Silence fell upon the room. It was Mealy Benoit's turn to answer. At that precise moment, however, Benoit was draining the salad bowl. He slowly swallowed the last of the red liquid. One can't do two things at once. Laid the bowl down, empty, on the table, and in thundering, dignified tones, demanded another, wiped his lips on the back of his sleeve, and turned his huge head toward the corner where Geoffrey was hunched up, saying, Will the gentleman kindly repeat his last remark? Ernestine moved furtively to Julio's side and affecting to be interested only in the argument going on between Geoffrey and Benoit, said without looking at him, The pale man with a greenish complexion said to the man with the guitar, It's he all right, because of the burn in the palm of his hand. Julio choked back an oath, and instinctively clenched his fist, but Ernestine already had moved on, and was huskily chaffing the young man with the budding beard. Julio sat with somber face and angry eyes, only replying in curt monosyllables to the occasional remarks of his next neighbor, Billy Tom. Marie, the waitress, was passing near him, and he signed for her to stop. "'Say, Marie,' he said, nodding toward the window that was behind him. "'What does that window open on to?' The girl thought for a moment. "'On to the cellar,' she said. "'This hall is in the basement.' "'And the cellar,' Julio went on. "'How do you get out of that?' "'You can't,' the servant answered.' There's no door. You have to come through here. Momentarily becoming more uneasy, Julio scrutinized the long tunnel of a room at the extreme end of which he was sitting. There was only one means of egress, up the narrow corkscrew staircase leading to the ground floor, and at the very foot of that staircase was the table occupied by the green man and the man with the guitar. A plate aimed by Hogshead Geoffrey at Mealy Benoit crashed against the opposite wall. Everyone jumped to his feet, the women screaming, the men swearing. The two market porters stood confronting one another, Hogshead Geoffrey brandishing a chair, Benoit trying to wrench the marble top from a table to serve as a weapon. The melee became general, plates smashing on the floor and dinner things flying towards the ceiling. Suddenly a shot rang out, but quickly, though it had been fired, the green man and the man with the guitar had seen who fired it. For the last few minutes, indeed, these two mysterious individuals had never taken their eyes off Julio. Julio, whom Berthe had supposed from his appearance to be an honest cattle drover, was undoubtedly a wonderful shot. Having observed that the room was lighted by a single chandelier composed of three electric lamps, and that the current was supplied by only two wires running along the cornice, Julio had taken aim at the wires and cut them clean in two with a single shot. Immediately following upon the shot, the room was plunged into absolute darkness. A perfectly incredible uproar ensued, men and women struggling together and shouting and trampling one another down, and crockery and dinner things crashing down from the sideboards and tables onto the floor. Above the din, a sudden hoarse cry of pain rang out. Help! And simultaneously, Berta, who was lost among the mob, heard a muttered exclamation in her ear and felt two hands groping all over her body as if trying to identify her. The young nurse was the only woman in the room wearing a hat. Half swooning with terror, she felt herself picked up and thrust upon a bench, 
and then someone whispered in a venuous voice, You are not to help number 25, the Rambert woman, to escape. Berta was so utterly astonished that she overcame her fright sufficiently to stammer out a question, But, but what? But who? Lower still, but yet more peremptorily, the voice became audible again. Fantomas forbid you to do it, and if you disobey, you die. The nurse dropped back upon the bench, half fainting with fright, and the row in the supper room grew worse. Three men were fighting now, the green man being at grips with two at once. The green man did not seem to feel the blows rained on him, but with a strength that was far beyond the ordinary, he gripped hold of an arm and slid his hands along the sleeve, never letting go of the arm, until he reached the wrist, when, wrenching open the clenched fist, he slipped his fingers into the palm of the hand. A little exclamation of triumph escaped him, and simultaneously the owner of the hand uttered an exclamation of pain, for the green man's fingers had touched a still raw wound upon the hollow of the palm. But at that instant his leg was caught between two powerful knees, and the slightest pressure more would have broken it. The green man was forced to let go the hand he held. He fell to the ground with his adversary near him, and for a moment thought that he was lost but at the same moment his adversary let go of him in return, having been taken by surprise by yet a third combatant who joined in the fray and separated the first two, devoting himself to a furious assault upon the man whom the green man had tried to capture. The green man passed a rapid hand over the individual who had just rescued him from the fierce assault, and was conscious of a shock of surprise as he identified the young man with the budding beard. Thereupon he collared him firmly by the neck and did not let him go. In the crush, the combatants had been forced toward the staircase, and at this narrow entrance into the hall bodies were being trampled underfoot and piercing screams rent the air. Francois Bonbon had not made the least attempt to interfere. He knew exactly the proper procedure when trouble of this sort broke out, and he had gone to the corner of the street and sent the constable on duty there to the nearest police station for help. Directly the first gendarmes arrived, François Bonbon had led them behind the counter in the shop and showed them the fire hose. With a skill acquired by long practice, they rapidly unrolled the pipe, introduced it into the narrow mouth of the staircase, turned on the tap, and proceeded to drench everybody in the supper room below. The unexpected sousing pulled the combatants up short, separated all the champions, and drove the howling and shrieking mob back to the far end of the room. The operation lasted for a good five minutes, and when the gendarmes considered that the customers of the St. Anthony's Pig were sufficiently quieted down, the sergeant threw the light of a lantern, which the proprietor obligingly had ready for him, over the supper room, and peremptorily ordered the company to come up, one by one. Seeing that resistance would be futile, the company obeyed. As they slowly emerged at the top of the corkscrew staircase, meek and subdued, the gendarmes at the top arrested them, slipped handcuffs on them, and sent them off in couples to the station. When the sergeant assumed that everyone had come out, he went down into the supper room just to make sure that nobody was still hiding there. But the room was not quite empty. One unfortunate man was lying on the floor, bathed in his own blood. It was the man with the guitar, and a knife had been driven through his breast. The couple consisting of the green man and the young man with the budding beard, of whom his companion had never once let go since identifying him during the fight in the supper room, were taken to the station. The clerk, who was taking down the names of the prisoners, with difficulty repressed an exclamation of surprise when the green man produced an identification card and whispered a few words in his ear. "'Release that gentleman at once,' said the clerk. "'With regard to the other,' With regard to the other, the green man broke in, kindly release him too. I want to keep him with me. The clerk bowed in consent, and both men were immediately released from their handcuffs. The young man stared in astonishment at the individual who a minute before had been his companion in bonds, and was about to thank him, but the other grasped him firmly by the wrist, as though to warn him of the impossibility of flight, and led him out of the police station, in the street, they met the sergeant with a gendarme bringing in the unfortunate man with a guitar, who was just breathing, and in whom the officials had recognized a detective inspector. 
Without letting go of the youth, the green man bent forward to the sergeant and had a brief but animated conversation with him. Yes, sir, that's all, the sergeant said respectfully. I haven't anyone else. The green man stamped his foot in wrath. Good Lord! Gurn has got away! Toward the Rue Montmartre, the green man rapidly dragged his companion, who was trembling in every limb, and utterly at a loss to guess what the figure held in store for him. Suddenly the green man halted, just under the light of a street lamp outside the church of San Eustache. He stood squarely in front of his prisoner and looked him full in the eyes. "'I am Juve,' he said, the detective, and as the young man stared at him in silent dismay, Juve went on, emphasizing each of the words, and with a sardonic smile flickering over his face. And you, Mademoiselle Jeanne, you are Charles Rambert. End of chapter 17 Recording by Alan Winteroud Boomcoach.blogspot.com Chapter 18 of Fantomas by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Fantomas by Marcel Alain and Pierre Souvestre. Translated by Cranston Metcalf. Chapter 18 A Prisoner and a Witness. Juve had spoken in a tone of command that brooked no reply. His keen eyes seemed to pierce through Paul and read his inmost soul. The winking light of the street lamp shed a wan halo around the lad, who obviously wanted to move away from its radius, but Juve held him fast. Come now, answer. You are Charles Rambert, and you were Mademoiselle Jeanne. I don't understand, Paul declared. Really? sneered Juve. He hailed a passing cab. Get in, he ordered briefly, and pushing the lad in before him, he gave an address to the driver, entered the cab, and shut the door. Juve sat there rubbing his hands as if well pleased with his night's work. For several minutes he remained silent, and then turned to his companion. You think it is clever to deny it, he remarked, but do you imagine it isn't obvious to anyone that you are Charles Rambert and that you were disguised as Mademoiselle Jeanne? But you are wrong, Paul insisted. Charles Rambert is dead. So you know that, do you? Then you admit that you know whom I am talking about. The lad colored and began to tremble. Juve looked out the window, pretending not to notice him, and smiled gently. Then he went on in a friendly tone. But you know it's stupid to deny what can't be denied. Besides, you should remember that if I know you are Charles Rambert, I must know something else as well, and therefore... Well, yes, Paul acknowledged. I am Charles Rambert, and I was disguised as Mademoiselle Jeanne. How did you know it? Why were you at the St. Anthony's Pig? Had you come to arrest me? And where are you taking me now, to prison? Juve shrugged his shoulders. You want to know too much, my boy. Besides, you ought to know Paris, and so ought to be able to guess where I told the driver to go, merely by looking at the streets we are passing through. That is exactly what frightens me, Charles Rambert replied. We are on the quays, near the law courts. And the police station, my son, quite so. Now it's quite useless to make a scene. You will gain nothing by attempting to get away. You are in the hands of justice, or rather in my hands, which is not quite the same thing, so come quietly. That is really good advice. A few minutes later, the cab stopped at the Tour Pointu, which has such melancholy associations for so many criminals. Juve alighted, and made his companion alight as well, paid the driver, and walked up the staircase to the first floor of the building. It was daylight now, and the men were coming on duty. All of them saluted Juve as he walked along with his trembling captive. The detective went down one long passage, turned into another, and opened a door. Go in there, he ordered curtly. Charles Rambert obeyed, and found himself in a small room, the nature of which he recognized immediately from the furniture it contained. It was the measuring room of the anthropometric service, so what he feared was about to happen. Juve was going to lock him up. But the detective called out in a loud tone, Hector, please! 
and one of the men who remained on duty in the department, in case they were required by any of the detective inspectors to find the records of any previously convicted criminal, came hurrying in. Ah, Monsieur Juve, and with a bag, too, so early? You think he has been here before? No, said Juve, in a dry tone that put a stop to further indiscreet questions. I don't want you to look up my companion's record, but to take his measurements, and very carefully, too. The man was somewhat surprised at the order, for it was not usual to be asked to do such work at so very early an hour. He was rather irritable, too, at being disturbed from the rest he was enjoying, and it was very curtly that he spoke to Charles Rambert. Come here, please. The standard first. Take off your boots. Charles Rambert obeyed, and stood under the standard of measurement, and then, as the assistant ordered him, he submitted to having his fingers smeared with ink so that his fingerprints might be taken, to being photographed, full face and in profile, and finally to having the width of his head from ear to ear measured with a special pair of caliber compasses. Hector was surprised by his docility. I must say your friend is not very talkative, Monsieur Juve. What has he been up to? And as the detective merely shrugged his shoulders and did not reply, he went on. That's done, sir. We will develop the negatives and take the prints, and recopy the measurements, and the record shall be classified in the register in a couple of hours. Charles Rambert grew momentarily more scared. He felt that he was definitely arrested now. But Juve left the armchair in which he had been resting, and coming up to him laid his hand upon his shoulder, speaking the while with a certain gentleness. Come, there are some other points as to which I wish to examine you. He led him from the anthropometric room along a dark corridor, and presently, taking a key from his pocket, opened a door and pushed the lad in before him. Go in there, he said. This is where we make the dynamometer tests. A layman looking around the room might almost have supposed that it was merely some carpenter's shop. Pieces of wood of various shapes and sizes and sorts were arranged along the wall or laid upon the floor. In glass cases, there were whole strips of metal, five or six inches long, and of varying thickness. Juve closed the door carefully behind him. "'For pity's sake, Monsieur Juve, tell me what you are going to do with me,' Charles Rambert implored. The detective smiled. "'Well, there you ask a question which I can't answer offhand. What am I going to do with you, eh? That still depends upon a good many things.' As he spoke, Juve tossed his hat aside, and looking at a rather high kind of little table, proceeded to remove from it a gray cloth which protected it from dust, and drew it into the middle of the room. This article was composed of a metal body screwed onto a strong tripod, with a lower tray that moved backwards and forwards, and two lateral buttresses upon a steel crosspiece firmly bolted onto them above. Upon this framework were two dynamometers worked by an ingenious piece of mechanism. Juve looked at Charles Rambert and explained. This is Dr. Bertillon's effraction dynamometer. I am going to make use of it to find out at once whether you are or are not deserving of some little interest. I don't want to tell you more just at present. Juve slipped into a specially prepared notch, a thin strip of wood, which he had selected with particular care from one of the heaps of materials arranged along the wall. From a chest he took a tool which Charles Rambert who had had some intimate experiences of late with the light-fingered community, immediately recognized as a jimmy. "'Take hold of that,' said Juve, and as Charles took it in his hand, he added, "'Now put the jimmy into this groove, and press with all your force. If you can move that needle to a point which I know, and which it is difficult but not impossible to reach, you may congratulate yourself on being in luck.'" Stimulated by this encouragement from the detective, Charles Rambert exerted all his force upon the lever, only afraid that he might not be strong enough. Juve stopped him very soon. That's all right, he said, and substituting a strip of sheet iron for the strip of wood, he handed another tool to the lad. Now try again. A few seconds later, Juve took a magnifying lens and closely examined both the strip of metal and the strip of wood. He gave a satisfied click with his tongue and seemed to be very pleased. Charles Rambert, he remarked, I think we are going to do a very good morning's work. 
Dr. Bertillon's new apparatus is an uncommonly useful invention. The detective might have gone on with his congratulatory monologue had not an attendant come into the room at that moment. Ah, there you are, Monsieur Juve. I have been looking for you everywhere. There is someone asking for you who says he knows you will receive him. I told him this was not the proper time, but he was so insistent that I promised to bring you his card. Besides, he says you have given him an appointment. Juve took the card and glanced at it. That's all right, he said. Take the gentleman into the parlor and tell him I will be with him in a minute. The attendant went out, and Juve looked at Charles Rambert with a smile. You are played out, he said. Before we do anything else, common humanity requires that you should get some rest. Come, follow me. I will take you to a room where you can throw yourself on a sofa and get asleep for a good hour at least while I go and see this visitor. He led the lad into a small waiting room, and as Charles Rambert obediently stretched himself upon the sofa, Juve looked at the pale and nervous and completely silent boy and said with even greater gentleness, There, go to sleep. Sleep quietly, and presently... Juve left the room, and called a man to whom he gave an order in a low tone. Stay with that gentleman, please. He is a friend of mine, but a friend, you understand, who must not leave this place. I am going to see someone, but I will come up again presently. And Juve hurried downstairs to the parlor. The visitor rose as the door opened and Juve made a formal bow. Monsieur Gervais Avantin, he said. Monsieur Gervais Avantin, that gentleman replied. And you are Detective Inspector Juve? I am, sir, the detective answered. And pointing his visitor to a chair, he took a seat himself at a small table littered with official documents. Sir, Juve began, I ventured to send you that pressing invitation to come to Paris today, because from inquiries I had made about you, I was sure that you were a man with a sense of duty who would not resent being put to an inconvenience when it was a question of cooperating in a work of justice and of truth. The visitor, a man of perhaps thirty, of somewhat fashionable appearance and careful though quiet dress, manifested much surprise. Inquiries about me, sir? And pray why? I must confess that I was very much astonished when I received your letter informing me that the famous Detective Inspector Juve wished to see me, and at first I suspected some practical joke. On consideration, I decided to obey your summons without further pressing, but I did not imagine that you would have made any inquiries about me. How do you know me, may I ask? Juve smiled. Is it the fact, he inquired, instead of replying directly, for like the good detective that he was, intensely keen on his work, he enjoyed mystifying people with whom he conversed. Is it the fact that your name is Gervais Aventine, a civil engineer, the possessor of considerable private means, about to be married, and that lately you made a short journey to Limoges? The young man nodded and smiled. Your information is perfectly correct in every particular, but I do not yet understand what crime of mine can have subjected me to these inquiries on your part. Jules smiled again. I wonder, sir, why you have vouchsafed no answer to the local inquiries which have been made at my instance, to the advertisements which I have inserted in the papers, in which I discreetly made it known that the police wanted to get into communication with all the passengers who traveled first class in the slow train from Paris to Lucon on the night of the 23rd of December last. This time the young man looked anxious. Great Scott! he exclaimed. Are you in the employment of my future father-in-law? Juve burst into a roar of laughter. First acknowledge that you did travel by that train on that night, that you got into it at Vierzon where you live and where you are going to be married, and that you were going to Limoges to see a lady, and that you did not want your fiancé's family to know anything about it. Gervais Aventine pulled himself together. I had no idea that the official police undertook espionage of that sort, he said rather dryly. But it is true, sir, that I went to Limoges, my last post before I was appointed to Vierzon, to take a final farewell to a lady. But since you are so accurately informed about all this, since you even know what train I went by, a train I deliberately chose because in little places like Vierzon so much notice is taken of people who travel by the express, you must also know... Juve checked him with a wave of his hand. 
A truce to jesting, he said. Excuse me, sir, I was only amusing myself by observing once more how quickly decent people, who have a little peccadillo on their conscience, are disturbed when they think they have been found out. Your love affairs do not matter to me, sir. I don't want to know if you have a lady friend or not. The information I want from you is of a very different nature. Tell me simply this. In what circumstances did you make that journey? What carriage did you get into? Who traveled with you in that carriage? I am asking you because, sir, I have every reason to believe that you traveled that night with a murderer who committed a crime of particular atrocity, and I think you may be able to give me some interesting information. The young man, who had been looking grave, smiled once more. I would rather have that than an inquiry into my defunct love affairs. Well, sir, I got into the train at Vierzon into a first-class carriage. What kind of carriage? One of the old-fashioned corridor carriages, that is to say, not a corridor communicating with the other carriages, but a single carriage with four compartments, two in the middle, opening onto the corridor, and two at the ends, communicating with the corridor by a small door. I know, said Juve, the lavatory is in the center, and the end compartments are like the ordinary non-corridor compartments, except that they have only seven seats, and also have the little door communicating with the narrow passage down one side of the carriage. That's it. I got into the smoking compartment at the end. Don't go too quick, said Juve. Tell me whom you saw in the various compartments. Let us go even further back. You were on the platform waiting for the train. It came in. What happened then? You want to be very precise, Gervais Aventine remarked. Well, when the train pulled up, I looked for the first-class carriage. It was a few yards away from me, and the corridor was alongside the platform. I got into the corridor and wanted to choose my compartment. I remember clearly that I went first to the rear compartment, the last one in the carriage. I could not get into that, for the door opening into it from the corridor was locked. That is correct, Juve nodded. I know from the guard that the compartment was empty. What did you do then? I turned back, and passing the ladies' compartment in the lavatory, decided to take my seat in the one next it, communicating with the corridor. But luck was against me. A pane of glass was broken, and it was bitterly cold there. So I had to fall back on the only compartment left, the smoking one toward the front of the train. Were there many of you there? I thought at first that I was going to have a fellow traveler, for there was some luggage and a rug arranged on the seat. But the passenger must have been in the lavatory, for I didn't see him. I lay down on the other seat and went to sleep. When I got out of the train at Limoges, my fellow traveler must have been in the lavatory again, for I remember quite distinctly that he was not on the opposite seat. I thought at the time how easy it would have been for me to steal his luggage and walk off with his valise. Nobody would have seen me. Juve had listened intently to every word of the story. He asked for one further detail, with a certain anxiety in his tone. Tell me, sir, when you woke up, did you have any impression that the baggage arranged on the seat opposite yours had been disturbed at all? Might the traveler, whom you did not see, have come in for a sleep while you yourself were asleep? Gervais Aventine made a little gesture of uncertainty. I can't answer in the affirmative, Monsieur Juve. I did not notice that, and besides, when I got into the compartment, the shade was pulled down over the lamp, and the curtains were drawn across the windows. I hardly saw how the things were arranged, and then when I got out at Limoges I was in a hurry, and only thought of finding my ticket and jumping onto the platform. But I do not think the other fellow did take his place while I was sleeping. I did not hear a sound, and yet I did not sleep at all heavily. So you traveled in a first-class compartment in the slow train from Paris to Lucon on the night of the 23rd of December, and in that compartment there was the luggage of a traveler whom you did not see, who may not have been there. Yes, said Gervais Aventine, and as the detective sat silent for a moment, he inquired, Is my information too vague to be of any use to you? Juve was wondering inwardly why the dickens Etienne Rambert was not in that compartment when, According to the depositions of the guard, he must have been there, but he said nothing of this. Instead, he said, Your information is most valuable, sir. You have told me everything I wanted to know. Gervais Aventine displayed still more surprise. Well, he said, by way of return, Monsieur Juve, tell me something which puzzles me. 
How did you know I traveled by that train that night? The detective drew out his pocketbook, and from an inner pocket produced a first-class ticket, which he held out to the engineer. That is very simple, he replied. Here is your ticket. I wanted to know exactly who everyone was who traveled in that first-class compartment, so I sent for all the first-class tickets which were given up by passengers who left the train at different stations. That's how I got yours. It had been issued at Vierzon, the station where you got in, so I interrogated the clerk at the booking office who gave me a description of you. Then I sent down an inspector to Vierzon to make discreet inquiries, and he got me all the information I required. All that I had to do then was to write and ask you to come here today, when the regrettable story of your broken relations with the lady was an ample guarantee to me that you would be punctual at the appointment. End of chapter 18 Recording by Alan Winteroud Boomcoach.blogspot.com Chapter 19 of Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestre. Translated by Cranston Metcalf. Chapter 19. Jerome Fandor. Whistling a quick step, sure sign with him of a light heart, Juve opened the door of the little room where he had left Charles Rambert and looked at the sleeping lad. It's a fine thing to be young, he remarked to the man he had left on guard. That boy plunges into the wildest adventures and shaves a scaffold by an inch, and yet after one late night he sleeps as peacefully as any chancellor of the Legion d'Honneur. He shook the lad with a friendly hand. Get up, lazy bones. It's ten o'clock. High time for me to carry you off. Where to? the unhappy boy asked, rubbing his eyes. There is no doubt about inquisitiveness being your besetting sin, Juve replied cryptically. Well, we've got a quarter of an hour's drive in front of us. But you're not going to prison. I'm going to take you home with me. Juve had taken off his collar and tie and put on an old jacket, and set a great bowl of bread and milk in front of Charles Rambert, and was leisurely enjoying his own breakfast. I didn't want to answer any questions just now, he said because I hate talking in cabs where I have to sit by a man's side and can't see him or hear half he says. But now that we are snug and comfortable here, I've no right to keep you waiting any longer, and I'll give you a bit of good news. Snug and comfortable were the right words with which to describe Jules' private abode. The detective had attained an honorable and lucrative position in his profession, and exposed as he was in the course of his work to all manner of dangers and privations, had compensated himself by making an entirely satisfactory, if not luxurious, nest where he could rest after his labors. When he had finished his breakfast, he lighted a big cigar and sank into an easy chair, crossing his hands behind his head. He turned a steady gaze upon Charles Rambert, who was still completely puzzled and half frightened by this sudden amiability and did not know whether he was a prisoner or not. I will give you a bit of good news, that is, that you are innocent of the Langrune affair when you were Charles Rambert, and innocent also of the Danidoff affair when you were Mademoiselle Jeanne. I need not say anything about the scrap last night, in which you played a still more distinguished part. Why tell me that? asked Charles Rambert nervously. Of course I know I did not rob Princess Sonia Danidoff. But how did you recognize me last night, and how did you find out that I was Mademoiselle Jeanne? Juve smiled, and shook back a lock of hair that was falling over his eyes. Listen, my boy, do you suppose that thundering blow you dealt the excellent Henri Verbier when he was making love to Mademoiselle Jeanne could fail to make me determined to find out who that young lady was who had the strength of a man? The illusion made Charles Rambert most uneasy but that does not explain how you recognized me in Paul last night. I recognized you and Henri Verbier at the hotel, but I had no idea that it was you last night. That's nothing, said Juve, with a shake of the head. And you may understand once for all that when I have once looked anybody square in the face, 
he needs to be an uncommonly clever fellow to escape me afterwards by means of any disguise. You don't know how to make up, but I do, and that's why I took you in, and you did not take me in. What makes you believe I did not rob Princess Sonia Danidoff? Charles Rambert asked after a pause. I am quite aware that everything points to my having been the thief. Not quite everything, Juve answered gently. There are one or two things you don't know, and I'll tell you one of them. The princess was robbed by the same man who robbed Madame van den Rosen, wasn't she? Well, Madame van den Rosen was the victim of a burglary. Some of the furniture in her room was broken into, and the tests I made this morning with the dynamometer proved to me that you are not strong enough to have caused those fractures. Not strong enough? Charles Rambert ejaculated. No. I told you at the time that your innocence would be proved if you were strong enough, but I said that to prevent you from playing tricks and not putting out all your strength. As a matter of fact, it was your comparative weakness that saved you. The dynamometer tests and the figures I obtained just now proved absolutely that you were innocent of the Van den Rosen robbery and, consequently, of the robbery from Sonia Danidoff. Again the lad reflected for a minute or two but you didn't know who I was when you came to the hotel, did you? And therefore had no suspicion that I was Charles Rambert? That's true, isn't it? How did you find out? I was supposed to be dead. That was a child's job, Juve replied. I got the anthropometric records of the body that had been buried as yours, and I planned to get symmetrical photographs of you and your character of Mademoiselle Jeanne, as I did of you today at headquarters. My first job was to lay hands upon Mademoiselle Jeanne, and I very soon found her, as I expected, turned into a man again, and living in the most disreputable company. I made any number of inquiries, and when I went to the St. Anthony's Pig last evening, I knew that it was some unknown person who had been buried in your stead, that Paul was Mademoiselle Jeanne, and that Mademoiselle Jeanne was Charles Rambert. It was my intention to arrest you, and to ascertain definitely by means of the dynamometer that you were innocent of the Langrune and the Danidoff crimes. What you tell me about the dynamometer explains how you know I am not the man who committed the robbery at the hotel, but what clears me in your eyes of the Langrune murder? Bless my soul, Juve retorted. You are arguing as if you wanted to prove you were guilty. Well, my boy, it's the same story as the other. The man who murdered the Marquise de Langrune smashed things and the dynamometer has proved that you are not strong enough to have been the man. And suppose I had been mad at the time, Charles Rambert said, his hesitation and his tone betraying his anxiety about the answer. Could I have been strong enough then? Might I have committed those crimes without knowing anything about it? But Juve shook his head. I know you are referring to your mother, and are haunted by an idea that through some hereditary taint you might be a somnambulist, and have done these things in your sleep. Come, Charles Rambert, finish your breakfast and put all that out of your head. To begin with, you would not have been strong enough, even then. And in the next place, there is nothing at present to show that you are mad, nor even that your poor mother, but I need not go on. I've got some rather odd notions on that subject. Then, Monsieur Juve, drop the Monsieur, call me Juve. Then, if you know that I am innocent, you can go and tell my father I have nothing to fear? I can reappear in my own name? Juve looked at the lad with an ironical smile. How you go ahead, he exclaimed. Please understand that although I do believe you are innocent, I am almost certainly the only person who does, and unfortunately I have not yet got any evidence that would be sufficiently convincing and certain to put the persuasion of your guilt out of your father's head or anybody else's. This is not the time for you to reappear. It would simply mean that you would be arrested by some detective who knows less than I do, and thrown into prison as you confidently expected to be this morning. Then what is to become of me? What do you think of doing yourself? Going to see my father. No, no, Juve protested once more. I tell you not to go. It would be stupid and utterly useless. Wait a few days, a few weeks if need be. When I have put my hand on Fantomas's shoulder, I will be the very first to take you to your father and proclaim your innocence. Why wait until Fantomas is arrested? 
Charles Rambert asked, the mere sound of the name seeming to wake all his former enthusiasm on the subject of that famous criminal. Because if you are innocent of the charge brought against you, it is extremely likely that Fantomas is the guilty party. When he is laid by the heels, you will be able to protest your innocence without any fear. Charles Rambert sat silent for some minutes, musing on the odd chance of destiny which required him to make his own return to normal life contingent on the arrest of a mysterious criminal who was merely suspected and had never been seen nor discovered. "'What do you advise me to do?' he asked presently. The detective got up and began to pace the room. "'Well,' he began, "'the first fact is that I am interested in you, and the next is that while I was having that rough and tumble last night with that scoundrel in the supper room, I thought for a minute or two that it was all up with me, and your chipping in saved my life. On the other hand, I may be said to have saved your life now by ascertaining your innocence and preventing your arrest. So we are quits in a way. But you began the delicate attentions, and I have only paid you back, so it's up to me to start a new series, and not turn you out into the street where you would inevitably get into fresh trouble. So this is what I propose. Change your name and go and take a room somewhere. Get into proper clothes, and then come back to me, and I'll give you a letter to a friend of mine who is on one of the big evening papers. You are well educated, and I know you are energetic. You are keen on everything connected with the police, and you'll get on splendidly as a reporter. You will be able to earn an honest and respectable name that way. Would you like to try that idea? It's awfully good of you, Charles Rambert said gratefully. I should love to be able to earn my living by work so much to my taste. Juve cut his thanks short and held out some banknotes. There's some money. Now clear out. It's high time we both got a little sleep. Get busy settling into rooms, and in a fortnight I shall expect you to be editor of La Capitale. Under what name shall you introduce me to your friend? Charles Rambert asked after a little nervous pause. Hmm, said Juve with a smile. It will have to be an alias, of course. Yes, and as it will be the name I shall write under, it ought to be an easy one to remember. Something arresting like Fantomas, said Juve chaffingly, amused by the curious childishness of this lad, who could take keen interest in such a trifle when he was in so critical a situation. Choose something not too common for the first name, and something short for the other. Why not keep that first syllable of Fantomas? Oh, I've got it. Fandor. What about Jerome Fandor? Charles Rambert murmured it over. Jerome Fandor. Yes, you are right. It sounds well. Juve pushed him out of the door. Well, Jerome Fandor, leave me to my slumbers and go and rig yourself out and get ready for the new life that I'm going to open up for you. Bewildered by the amazing adventures of which he had just been the central figure, Charles Rambert, or Jerome Fandor, walked down Juve's staircase wondering, why should he take so much trouble about me? What interest or what motive can he have, and how on earth does he find out such a wonderful lot of things? End of chapter 19 Recording by Alan Winteroud Boomcoach.blogspot.com Chapter Twenty of Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra, translated by Cranston Metcalf. Chapter Twenty: A Cup of Tea. After the tragic death of her husband, Lady Beltham, whose previous life had inclined to the austere, withdrew into almost complete retirement. The world of gaiety and fashion knew her no more, but in the world where poverty and suffering reign, in hospital wards and squalid streets, a tall and beautiful woman might often be seen, robed all in black, with distinguished bearing and eyes serene and grave, distributing alms and consolations as she moved. It was Lady Beltham, kind, good, and very pitiful, bent on the work of charity to which she had vowed her days. Yet she had not allowed herself to be crushed by sorrow. After the tragedy which left her a widow, she had assumed the effective control of her husband's property, 
and helped by faithful friends, had carried on his interests and administered his estates, spreading a halo of kindness all around her. To help her in the heavy correspondence entailed by all these affairs, she found three secretaries none too many. On Monsieur Etienne Rambert's recommendation, Therese Avernois was now one of these, and the young girl was perfectly happy in her new surroundings. Time was helping her to forget the tragedy which had taken her grandmother from her at Beaulieu, and she enjoyed the company of the well-born, well-bred English gentlewomen. Lady Beltham was reclining on a sofa in the great hall of her house at Nuya. It was a spacious room, furnished half as a lounge and half as an office, and Lady Beltham liked to receive people there. A large glass-enclosed balcony commanded a view over the garden and the boulevard Richard Wallace beyond, with the Bois de Boulogne beyond that again. A few minutes before, a footman had brought in a table and set out tea things, and Lady Beltham was reading while Therese and the two English girls were chattering amongst themselves. The telephone rang, and Therese answered it. "'Hello? Yes, yes. You want to know if you may call this evening? The Reverend... Oh, yes, you have just come from Scotland. Hold on a minute. She turned to Lady Beltham. It is Mr. William Hope, and he wants to know if you will see him tonight. He has just come from your place in Scotland. The dear man, exclaimed Lady Beltham. Of course he may come. And as Therese turned lightly to convey her permission to the clergyman waiting at the other end of the line, she caught a smile on the face of one of the other girls. What is the joke, Lisbeth? she inquired. The girl laughed brightly. I think the worthy parson must have smelt the tea and toast, and wants to make up for the wretched dinner he got in the train. You are incorrigible, Lady Beltham replied. Mr. Hope is above such material matters. Indeed he isn't, Lady Beltham, the girl persisted. Why, only the other day he told Therese that all food deserved respect, and esteem directly a blessing had been asked upon it, and that a badly cooked steak was a kind of sacrilege. A badly cooked pheasant, Therese corrected her. You are both wicked little slanderers, Lady Beltham protested gently, and don't know the blessing a good appetite is. You do, Susanna, don't you? Susanna, a pretty Irish girl, looked up from a letter she was reading and blushed. Oh, Lady Beltham, I've been ever so much less hungry since Harry's ship sailed. I don't quite see the connection, Lady Beltham answered. Love is good nourishment for the soul, but not for the body. However, a good appetite is nothing to be ashamed of, and you ought to keep your roses for your future husband, and qualify in every way to be an excellent mother of a family. With lots and lots of children, Lisbeth went on wickedly, seven or eight daughters at the very least, all of whom will marry nice young clergymen when their time comes, and... She stopped speaking, and the light chatter died away as a footman entered and announced the Reverend William Hope who followed him immediately into the room, an elderly man with a full, clean-shaven face and a comfortable portliness of figure. Lady Beltham offered him a cordial hand. I am delighted you are back, she said. Will you take a cup of tea with us? The parson made a general bow to the girls gathered about the table. I got a wretched dinner in the train, he began, but Lisbeth interrupted him. Don't you think this tea smells delicious, she asked. The parson put out his hand to take the cup she offered him, and bowed and smiled. Precisely what I was going to observe, Miss Lisbeth. Therese and Susanna turned away to hide their amusement, and Lady Beltham adroitly changed the subject. She moved toward her writing table. Mr. Hope must have much to tell me, girls, and it is getting late. I must get to business. Did you have a good journey? Quite as good as usual, Lady Beltham. The people at Scotwell Hill are very plucky and good, but it will be a hard winter. There is snow on the hills already. Have the women and children had all their woolen things? Oh, yes. Twelve hundred garments have been distributed according to a list drawn up by the under-steward. Here it is. And he handed a paper to Lady Beltham, who passed it on to Susanna. I will ask you to check the list, she said to the girl, and turned again to the clergyman. The under-steward is a good fellow, but he is a rabid politician. He may have omitted some families that are openly radical. But I think charity should be given equally to all, for poverty makes no political distinctions. That is the right Christian view, the clergyman said approvingly. And what about the sanatorium at Glasgow, Lady Beltham went on? 
It is very nearly finished, the good man answered. I have got your lawyers to cut down the contractor's accounts by something like fifteen per cent, which means a saving of nearly three hundred pounds. Excellent, said Lady Beltham, and she turned to Thérèse. You must add that three hundred pounds to the funds of the Scotwell Hill Coal Charity, she said. They will want all of it if the winter is going to be a hard one, and Thérèse made a note of the instructions full of admiration for Lady Beltham's simple generosity. But Mr. Hope was fidgeting on his chair. He seized an opportunity when Lady Beltham, busy making notes, had turned her deep and steady eyes away from him to say in a low tone, Have I your permission just to mention poor Lord Beltham? Lady Beltham started, and her face betrayed an emotion which she bravely controlled. Hearing the name pronounced, the three girls withdrew to the far end of the room, where they began to talk among themselves. Lady Beltham signified her assent, and Mr. Hope began. You know, dear friend, this has been my first visit to Scotland since Lord Beltham's death. I found your tenants still grievously upset by the tragedy that occurred nearly a year ago. They have got by heart all the newspaper accounts of the mysterious circumstances attending Lord Beltham's death, but those are not enough to satisfy the sympathetic curiosity of these excellent people, and I was obliged to tell them over and over again in full detail all we knew." I hope no scandal is gathered round his name, said Lady Beltham quickly. You need have no fear of that, the clergyman replied in the same low tone. The rumor that got about when the crime was first discovered, that Lord Beltham had been surprised in an intrigue and killed in revenge, has not won acceptance. Local opinion agrees that he was decoyed into a trap and killed by the man Gurn, who meant to rob him, but who was either surprised or thought he was going to be, and fled before he had time to take the money or the jewels from the body of the victim. They know that the murderer has never been caught, but they also know that there is a price on his head, and they all hope the police— Oh, forgive me for recalling all these painful memories. While he had been speaking, Lady Beltham's face had expressed almost every shade of emotion and distress. It seemed to be drawn with pain at his concluding words, but she made an effort to control herself and spoke resignedly. It cannot be helped, dear Mr. Hope. Go on. But the clergyman changed the topic. Oh, I was quite forgetting, he said more brightly. The under-steward has turned out the two Tillies, quite on his own authority. You must remember them, two brothers, blacksmiths, who drank a great deal and paid very little, and created so much scandal in the place. I object to the under-steward doing any such thing without referring to me first, Lady Beltham exclaimed warmly. Man's duty is to persuade and forgive, not to judge and punish. Kindness breeds kindness, and it is pity that wins amendment. Why should a subordinate, my under-steward, presume to do what I would not permit myself to do? She had sprung to her feet and was pacing excitedly about the room. She had wholly dropped the impassive mask she habitually wore, concealing her own personality. The three girls watched her in silence. The door opened anew, and Silbertown came in, the major-domo of Lady Beltham's establishment at Neuilly. He brought the evening letters, and the girls speedily took all the envelopes and newspapers from the tray and began to sort and open them, while the major-domo entered into conversation with his mistress, and the Reverend William Hope seized the opportunity to say good night and take his leave. Many of the letters were merely appeals to help in money or in kind, but one long letter Elizabeth handed to Lady Beltham, she glanced at the signature. "'Ah, here is news of Monsieur Etienne Rambert,' she exclaimed, and as Thérèse instinctively drew near, knowing that she too might hear something of what her old friend had written, Lady Beltham put the letter into her hand. "'You read it, my dear, and then you can tell me presently what he has to say.' Thérèse read the letter eagerly. Monsieur Etienne Rambert had left Paris a week before, upon a long and important journey. The energetic old fellow was to make a trip in Germany first, and then go from Hamburg to England, where he had some business to attend on behalf of Lady Beltham, with whom he was on more confidential terms than ever. Then he meant to sail from Southampton and spend the winter in Columbia, where he had important interests of his own to look after. While Therese was reading, Lady Beltham continued her conversation with her major-domo. "'I am glad you had the park gate seen to this afternoon,' she said. You know how nervous I am. My childhood in Scotland was very lonely, 
and ever since then I have had a vague terror of solitude and darkness. The major domo reassured her. He had no lack of self-confidence. There is nothing for your ladyship to be afraid of. The house is perfectly safe and carefully guarded. Walter the porter is a first-rate watchdog and always sleeps with one eye open, and I, too... Yes, I know, Silberton, the young widow replied, and when I give myself time to think, I am not nervous. Thank you. You may leave me now. She turned to the three girls. I am tired, dears. We won't stay up any later. Lisbeth and Susanna kissed her affectionately and went away. Therese lingered a moment to bring a book, a Bible, and place it on a table close to Lady Beltham's chair. Lady Beltham laid a hand upon her head as if in blessing, and gently said, Good night. God bless you, dear child. End of chapter 20 Recording by Alan Winteroud Boomcoach.blogspot.com One of Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra. Translated by Cranston Metcalf. Chapter 21 Lord Beltham's Murderer. It was on the point of midnight, and absolute silence reigned throughout the house. But Lady Beltham had not gone to bed. Although she had remained in the great hall where she did her work, she had been unable to settle down to any occupation. She had read a little, and begun a letter, got up and sat down, and finally, beginning to feel chilly, she had drawn an easy chair up to the hearth, where a log was just burning out, and stretching out her slippers to the warmth had fallen into a waking dream. A sound caught her ear, and she sat upright. At first she thought it was some trick of the imagination, but in another minute the noise grew louder. There was the hurrying of feet and voices, muffled at first, but rapidly becoming louder, and at last a regular uproar, doors banging, glass breaking, and shouts from all parts of the house. Lady Beltham jumped up, nervous and trembling. She was just going to the window when she heard a shot, and stopped dead where she stood. Then she rushed out into the vestibule. Help! she screamed. What on earth is the matter? and remembering the girls for whom she had assumed responsibility, she called out anxiously for them, Lisbeth, Therese, Susanna, come to me. Doors upstairs were flung open, and with their hair streaming over their nightdresses, Therese and Susanna rushed downstairs and crouched by her side, stifling moans of terror. Lisbeth, where is Lisbeth? Lady Beltham asked sharply. At the same moment she appeared, her face distorted with fright. Oh, Lady Beltham, it is dreadful. There's a man, a burglar in the garden, and Walter is throttling him, and they're fighting dreadfully. They'll kill one another. Silbertown, the majordomo, came rushing in just then. Seeing the three girls in their nightdresses, he made as if to draw back, but Lady Beltham called him in and demanded explanations. We had just finished our rounds, he answered breathlessly, when we caught sight of a man hiding in the shadows, a thief probably. When we shouted him, he ran away, but we ran after him and seized him. He resisted, and there was a fight. But we have got him, and the police will take him away in a few minutes. Lady Beltham listened, with jaw set and hands clenched. A thief, she said, controlling her emotion. How do you know he is a thief? Well, stammered the majordomo, he is very poorly dressed, and besides, what was he doing in the garden? Lady Beltham was recovering her calm. What excuse did he give for being there? she asked coldly. We didn't give him time to invent one, said the major domo. We collared him almost as soon as we saw him. And you know, madam, how tremendously powerful Walter is. Walter gave him all he deserved. And the major domo clenched his fists and made an expressive exhibition of the porter's reception of the stranger. Lisbeth was still overcome by what she had seen. Oh, the blood, she murmured hysterically. It was streaming. Lady Beltham spoke angrily to the majordomo. I hate brutality. Is the man seriously hurt? I hope not. You ought to have questioned me before assaulting him. No one in my house has a right to use violence. Whom so smites with the sword shall perish by the sword. The majordomo heard her in silent astonishment. It was not at all what he expected to be told, 
in view of all the circumstances. Lady Beltham went on more gently. I suppose I shall have to apologize to this man for your wrong and thoughtless behavior. Apologize? exclaimed Silberdown in amazement. Surely your ladyship will not do that. One must not shrink from humiliation when one has been in the wrong, said Lady Beltham, in the pulpit manner she affected. Tell Walter to come to me. A few minutes later the porter, a muscular giant of a man, came into the room and made a clumsy bow. How is it possible for anyone to get into the house at this time of night? his mistress inquired coldly. Walter dropped his eyes and raised his cap nervously. I hope your ladyship will forgive me. I caught the fellow, and as he was struggling I hit him. Then two of the footmen came, and they are looking after him in the kitchen. Has he given any explanation of his presence here since you assaulted him? At which I am very angry, said Lady Beltham. He hasn't said anything, at, at least. Well, I don't like to tell you. Please do like, said Lady Beltham irritably. Well, Walter replied, overcoming his nervousness with an effort. He says your ladyship is well known for your charity to everybody, and, and he wants to see you. There was a moment's pause. I shall see him, said Lady Beltham at last, in a half-stifled voice. Will your ladyship allow me to point out the danger of doing any such thing? Silbertown exclaimed. Very likely the man is a lunatic, or it may be a trick. Lord Beltham was murdered, and perhaps... Lady Beltham looked intently at the major-domo, seemingly trying to read his thoughts. Then she answered slowly, I will see him. I will be more pitiful than you. And as the major-domo and the porter made a gesture of futile protest, she added peremptorily, I have given my orders. Kindly obey. When the two men had reluctantly left the room, Lady Beltham turned to the three girls. You had better leave me, darling, she said, kindly but firmly. Run away. Excitement is bad for you. Go back to bed. No, I assure you I will be in no danger whatever. And for a few minutes she was left alone. Speak, said Lady Beltham in a toneless voice. The major-domo and the porter had led in and placed before her a man with unkempt hair and ragged beard. He was dressed entirely in black, and his face was tired and haggard. Lady Beltham, ghastly pale, was leaning for support against the back of an armchair. The man did not raise his eyes to her. "'I will not speak unless we are alone,' he answered dully. "'Alone?' said Lady Beltham, fighting down her emotion. "'Then is it something serious you have to tell me?' If you know anything of people in misfortune, madam, the man answered gently, you know that they do not like to humiliate themselves before before those who cannot understand, and he nodded toward the major-domo and the porter. I do know something of misfortune, Lady Beltham replied in firmer tones, and I will hear you alone. She looked at her two servants. Leave us, please. The major-domo started. Leave you alone with him? It's madness! and as Lady Beltham merely looked at him in haughty surprise, he began to withdraw in confusion, but still protesting, It's, it's, your ladyship has no idea what this fellow wants. Do, please. But Lady Beltham curtly cut him short. That is enough. A heavy velvet curtain fell over the closing door, and in the room that was dimly lighted by a small electric lamp, Lady Beltham was alone with the strange individual to whom she had so readily, so oddly consented to accord a private interview. She followed her servants to the door and locked it after them. Then, with a sudden movement, she sprang towards the man, who was standing motionless in the middle of the room, following her with his eyes, and flung herself into his arms. "'Oh, Gurn! My darling! My darling!' she cried. "'I love you! I love you, darling!' She looked up at him and saw blood upon his forehead. "'Good God! The brutes have hurt you!' What pain you must be in! Give me your eyes, your lips! With kisses from her own lips, she staunched the blood that was trickling down his cheeks, and with her fingers she smoothed his hair. I am so happy, she murmured, and broke off again. But are you mad? Why, why come here like this and let yourself be caught and tortured so? Moodily Gurn answered, returning kiss for kiss. Time has been so long without you, and this evening I was prowling round and saw a light. 
I thought that everyone would be asleep, except you, of course, and so I came straight to you, over walls and gates, drawn to you like a moth to a candle, and that is all. With shining eyes and heaving breast, Lady Beltham clung to her lover. I love you so. How brave you are. Yes, I am wholly, only yours. But this is madness. You might be arrested and given up to no one knows what horror without my knowing. Gurn seemed to be hypnotized by the fierce and passionate love of this great lady. I never gave that a thought, he murmured. I only thought of you. Silence fell upon these tragic lovers, as they stood reading love in one another's eyes, and recalling memories common to both, utterly unlike as they were to outward seeming, yet linked by the strongest bond of all, the bond of love. What happy hours we lived together out there, Lady Beltham whispered. Her thoughts had wandered to the far Transvaal, and the battlefield where first she had set eyes on Gurn, the sergeant of artillery with powder-blackened face, and then to the homeward voyage on the mighty steamer that bore them across the blue sea toward the dull white cliffs of England. Gurn's thoughts followed hers. Out there, yes, and then on that vast ocean, on the ship homeward bound, the quiet and peace of it all, and our meetings every day, our long, long talks and longer silences, in the clear starlight of those tropical skies, we were learning to know each other. We were learning to love each other, she said, and then London, and Paris, and all the fever of life threatening our love, but that is the strongest thing in the world, and, do you remember? Oh, the ecstasy of it all! But do you remember, too, what you did for me, through me, thirteen months ago? She had risen, and with white lips and haggard eyes held Gurn's hands within her own in an even tighter grip. Emotion choked her further utterance. Yes, I remember, Gurn went on slowly. It was in our little room in the Rue La Verre, and I was on my knees beside you when the door opened quietly, and there stood Lord Beltham, mad with rage and jealousy. I don't know what happened then, Lady Beltham whispered in a hopeless undertone, drooping her head again. I do, muttered Gurn. His eyes sought you, and a pistol was pointed at your heart. He would have fired, but I sprang and struck him down, and then I strangled him. Lady Beltham's eyes were fixed on the man's hands that she still held between her own. And I saw the muscles in these hands swell up beneath the skin as they tightened on his throat. I killed him, groaned the man. But Lady Beltham, swept by a surge of passion, sprang up and sought his lips. Oh, Gurn, she sobbed, my darling. Listen, said Gurn harshly, after a pause of anxious silence. I had to see you tonight, or who knows if tomorrow... Lady Beltham shrank at the words, but Gurn went on unheeding. The police are after me. Of course, I have made myself almost unrecognizable, but twice just lately I have been very nearly caught. Do you think the police have any accurate idea of what happened? Lady Beltham asked abruptly. No, said Gurn after a moment's hesitation. They think I killed him with the mallet. They have not found out that I had to strangle him. As far as I know, they found no marks of my hands on his throat. At all events, they could not have been clear for the collar, you understand. The man spoke of his crime without the least sign of remorse or repugnance now. His only dread was lest he should be caught. But nonetheless, they have identified me. That detective Juve is very clever. We did not have enough presence of mind, Lady Beltham said despairingly. We ought to have led them to suspect someone else, have made them think that it was, say, Fantomas. Not that, said Gurn nervously. Don't talk about Fantomas. We did all we could. But the main thing now is that I should escape them. I had better get away, across the Channel, across the Atlantic, anywhere. But would you come too? Lady Beltham did not hesitate. She flung her arms around the neck of the man who had murdered her own husband, and yielded to a paroxysm of wild passion. You know that I am yours wherever you may go. Shall it be tomorrow? We can meet, you know where, and arrange everything for your flight. My flight? said Gurn, with reproachful emphasis on the pronoun. For our flight, she replied, and Gurn smiled again. Then that is settled, he said. I have seen you, and I am happy. Good-bye. He made a step towards the door, but Lady Beltham stayed him gently. Wait, she said. Walter shall let you out of the house. Do not say anything. I will explain. 
I will invent some story to satisfy the servants as to your coming here, and also to justify your being allowed to go. They clung to one another in a parting caress. Lady Beltham tore herself away. Till tomorrow, she whispered. She stole to the door and unlocked it noiselessly, then crossed the room and rang the bell placed near the fireplace. Resuming her impassive mask and the haughty air and attitude of cold indifference that were in such utter contrast to her real character, she waited while Gurn stood upright and still in the middle of the room. Walter the porter came in. Take that man to the door and let no harm be done to him, said Lady Beltham proudly and authoritatively. He is free. Without a word or sign or glance, Gurn went out of the room, and Walter followed behind him to obey his mistress's command. Once more alone in the great hall, Lady Beltham waited nervously to hear the sound of the park gate closing behind Gurn. She did not dare go on to the balcony to follow her departing lover with her eyes. So, shaken by her recent emotions, she stood waiting and listening in an agony to know that he was safe. Then of a sudden, the noise that she had heard an hour before broke on her ears again, the noise of hurrying feet and broken shouts, and words, vague at first, but rapidly growing clearer. She crouched forward listening, filled with a horrible fear, her hand laid upon her scarcely beating heart. "'There he is! Hold him!' someone shouted. "'That's him, all right. Look out, constable!' "'This way, inspector. Yes, it's him. It's Gurn. Ah, would you?' Paler than death, Lady Beltham cowered down upon a sofa. "'Good God, good God!' she moaned. "'What are they doing to him?' The uproar in the garden decreased, then voices sounded in the corridor, Silvertown's exclamations rising above the frightened cries of the three young girls. "'Gurn! Arrested! The man who murdered Lord Beltham!' Lisbeth called out in anxious terror. "'But Lady Beltham! Dear God, perhaps he has murdered her, too!' The door was flung open, and the girls rushed in. Lady Beltham, by a tremendous effort of will, had risen to her feet, and was standing by the end of the sofa. "'Lady Beltham, alive! Yes, yes!' And Therese and Lisbeth and Susanna rushed sobbing to her and smothered her with caresses. But the agonized woman motioned them away. With hard eyes and set mouth, she moved toward the window, straining her ears to listen. From the park outside, Gurn's voice rang distinctly. The lover wished to let his mistress know what had happened, and to take a last farewell. I am caught, I am caught, yes, I am Gurn, and I am caught. The fatal words were still ringing in Lady Beltham's ears when the major domo, Silbertown, came bursting into the room, with radiant face and shining eyes and smiling lips, and hurried to his mistress. I thought as much, he exclaimed excitedly. It was the villain, all right. I recognized him from the description, in spite of his beard. I informed the police. As a matter of fact, they have been watching for the last two days. Just fancy, your ladyship, a detective was shadowing Gurn, and when he was going out of the house, I gave him the signal. Lady Beltham stared at the major domo in mute horror. Yes, she muttered, on the point of swooning. I pointed him out to the police, and it's thanks to me, your ladyship, that Gurn, the murderer, has been arrested at last. For just another moment, Lady Beltham stared at the man who gave her those appalling tidings, seemed to strive to utter something, then fell prone to the floor unconscious. The major domo and the girl sprang to her side to lavish attentions upon her. At that moment, the door was pushed a little way open, and the figure of Juve appeared. May I come in? said he. End of chapter 21 Recording by Alan Winteroud boomcoach.blogspot.com Chapter 22 of Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Winteroud Fantomas by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra Translated by Cranston Metcalf Chapter 22 the scrap of paper. It was three o'clock when Juve arrived at the Rue Le Vert, and he found the concierge of number 147 just finishing her coffee. Amazed at the results achieved by the detective, the details of which she had learned from the sensational articles in the daily paper she most affected, Madame de Lanc 
had conceived a most respectful admiration for the inspector of the criminal investigation department. That man, she constantly exclaimed to Madame Aurore, it isn't eyes he has in his head, it's telescopes, magnifying glasses. He sees everything in a minute, even when it isn't there. She gave him an admiring good afternoon, inspector, as he came into her lodge, and going to a board on which numbers of keys were hanging, took one down and handed it to him. So there's something fresh today, she said. I've just seen in the paper that Monsieur Gurn has been arrested. So it was my lodger who did it? What a dreadful man! Whoever would have thought it? It turns my blood cold to think of him. Juve was never a man for general conversation, and he was still less interested in the garrulity of this loquacious creature. He took the key and cut short her remarks by walking to the door. Yes, Gurn has been arrested, he said shortly, but he has made no confession, so nothing is known for certain yet. Please go on with your work exactly as though I were not in the house, Madame de Lonc. It was his usual phrase, and a constant disappointment to the concierge, who would have asked nothing better than to go upstairs with the detective and watch him at his wonderful work. Juve went up the five floors to the flat formerly occupied by Gurn, reflecting somewhat moodily. Of course Gurn's arrest was a success, and it was satisfactory to have the scoundrel under lock and key. But in point of fact, Juve had learned nothing new in consequence of the arrest, and he was obsessed with the idea that this murder of Lord Beltham was an altogether exceptional crime. He did not yet know why Gurn had killed Lord Beltham, and he did not even know exactly who Gurn himself was. All he could declare was that the murder had been planned and carried out with marvelous audacity and skill, and that was not enough. Juve let himself into the flat and closed the door carefully behind him. The rooms were in disorder, the result of the searches effected by the police. The rent had not been paid for some time, and as no friend or relation had come forward to assume control of Gurn's interests, the furniture and ornaments of the little flat were to be sold by auction. The detective walked through the rooms, then flung himself into an armchair. He did not know precisely why he had come. He had searched the place a dozen times already since the discovery of the corpse within the trunk, and had found nothing more, no tell-tale marks or fresh detail, to assist in the elucidation of the mystery. He would have given very much to be able to identify Gurn with some other of the many criminals who had passed through his hands, and still more to be able to identify him with that one most mysterious criminal whose fearful deeds had shocked the world so greatly. Somehow the particular way in which this murder was committed, the very audacity of it, led him to think, to sense, almost to swear that... Juve got up. It was little in accord with his active temperament to sit still. Once more he went around the flat. The kitchen? Let me see. I have been through everything. The stove, the cupboards, the saucepans. Why, I went so far as to make sure there was no poison in them, though it seemed a wild idea. The anteroom? Nothing there. The umbrella stand was empty, and the one interesting thing I did see, the torn curtain, has been described and photographed officially. He went back to the dining room. I've searched all the furniture, and I went through all the parcels Gurn had done up before he left, and would, no doubt, have come back for at his leisure had it not been for my discovery of the body, and the unfortunate publicity the newspapers gave to that fact. In one corner of the room was a heap of old newspapers, crumpled and torn and thrown down in disorder. Juve kicked them aside. I've looked through all that, even read the agony columns, but there was nothing there. He went into the bedroom and contemplated the bed that the concierge had stripped. The chairs set one on top of another in a corner, and the wardrobe that stood empty, its former contents scattered on the floor by the police during their search. There, too, nothing was to be found. Against the wall near the fireplace was a little escritoire with a cupboard above it, containing a few battered books. My men have been all through that, Juve muttered. It's most unlikely that they missed anything, but perhaps I had better see. He sat down before it and began methodically to sort the scattered papers. With quick, trained glance, he scanned each document, putting one after another aside with a grimace expressive of disappointment. Almost the last document he picked up 
was a long sheet of parchment, and as he unfolded it, an exclamation escaped his lips. It was an official notice of Gurn's promotion to the rank of sergeant when fighting under Lord Beltham in the South African War. Juve read it through, he knew English well, and laid it down with a gesture of discouragement. It is extraordinary, he muttered. That seems to be perfectly authentic. It is authentic, and it proves that this fellow was a decent fellow and a brave soldier once. That is a fine record of service. He drummed his fingers on the desk and spoke aloud. Is Gurn really Gurn, then? And have I been mistaken from start to finish in the little romance I have been weaving round him? How am I to find the key to the mystery? How am I to prove the truth of what I feel to be so very close to me, but which eludes me every time, just as I seem to be about to grasp it? He went on with his search, and then, looking at the bookcase, took the volumes out and holding each by its two covers, shook it to make sure that no papers were hidden among the leaves, but all in vain. He did the same with a large railway timetable and several shipping calendars. The odd thing is, he thought, that all these timetables go to prove that Gurn really was the commercial traveler he professed to be. It's exactly things such as these one would expect to find in the possession of a man who traveled much, and always had to be referring to the dates of sailing to distant parts of the world. In the bookcase was a box, made to represent a bound book, and containing a collection of ordnance maps. Juve took them out to make sure that no loose papers were included among them, and one by one unfolded every map. Then a sharp exclamation burst from his lips. Good Lord! Now there! In his surprise, he sprang up so abruptly that he pushed back his chair and overturned it. His excitement was so great that his hands were shaking as he carefully spread out upon the desk one of the ordnance maps he had taken from the case. It's the map of the central district, all right, the map which shows Cahors and Brive and saint joire and Beaulieu, and the missing piece. It is the missing piece that would give that precise district. Juve stared at the map with hypnotized gaze, for a piece had been cut out of it, cut out with a penknife neatly and carefully, and that piece must have shown the exact district where the chateau stood, which had been occupied by the Marquise de Langrune. Oh, if I could only prove it, prove that the piece missing from this map, this map belonging to Gurn, is really and truly the piece I found near Verrier Station, just after the murder of the Marquise de Langrune, what a triumph that would be! What a damning proof! What astounding consequences this discovery of mine might have! Juve made a careful note of the number of the map, quickly and nervously folded it up again, and prepared to leave the flat. He had made but a step or two towards the door, when a sharp ring at the bell made him jump. The deuce, he exclaimed softly. Who can be coming to ring Gurn up when everybody in Paris knows he has been arrested? And he felt mechanically in his pocket to make sure that his revolver was there. Then he smiled. What a fool I am. Of course, it is only Madame de Lonc wondering why I am staying here so long. He strode to the door, flung it wide open, and then recoiled in astonishment. You, he exclaimed, surveying the caller from top to toe. You, Charles Rambert? Or I should say, Jerome Fandor? Now what the deuce does this mean? End of chapter 22 Recording by Alan Winteroud Boomcoach dot blogspot dot com twenty three of Fantomas by Marcel Alain and Pierre Suvestre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Fantomas by Marcel Alain and Pierre Suvestre. Translated by Cranston Metcalf. Chapter twenty three. The Wreck of the Lancaster. Jerome Fandor entered the room without a word. Juve closed the door behind him. The boy was very pale and manifestly much upset. What is the matter? said Juve. Something terrible has happened, the boy answered. I have just heard awful news. My poor father is dead. What? Juve exclaimed sharply. Monsieur Etienne Rambert dead? Jerome Fandor put a newspaper into the detective's hand. 
Read that, he said, and pointed to an article on the front page with a huge headline, Wreck of the Lancaster, 150 Lives Lost. There were tears in his eyes, and he had such obvious difficulty in restraining his grief that Juve saw that to read the article would be the speediest way to find out what had occurred. The Red Star Liner Lancaster, plying between Caracas and Southampton, had gone down with all hands the night before, just off the Isle of Wight, and at the moment of going to press only one person was known to have been saved. There was a good sea running, but it was by no means rough, and the vessel was still within sight of the lighthouse and making for the open sea at full speed, when the lighthouseman suddenly saw her literally blown into the air and then disappear beneath the waves. The alarm was given immediately, and boats of all kinds put off to the scene of the disaster. But though a great deal of wreckage was still floating about, only one man of the crew was seen, clinging to a spar. He was picked up by the Campbell and taken to hospital, where he was interviewed by the Times, without, however, being able to throw any light upon what was an almost unprecedented catastrophe in the history of the sea. All he could say was that the liner had just got up full speed and was making a perfectly normal beginning of her trip, when suddenly a tremendous explosion occurred. He himself was engaged at the moment fastening the tarpaulins over the baggage hold, and he was confident that the explosion occurred among the cargo. But he could give absolutely no more information. The entire ship seemed to be riven asunder, and he was thrown into the sea, stunned, and knew no more until he recovered consciousness and found himself aboard the Campbell. It's quite incomprehensible, Juve muttered. Surely there can't have been any powder aboard. No explosives are carried on these great liners. They only take passengers and the mails. He scanned the list of passengers. Etienne Rambert's name is given among the first-class passengers right enough, he said. Well, it's odd. Jerome Fandor heaved a profound sigh. It is a fatality which I shall never get over, he said. When you told me the other day that you knew I was innocent, I ought to have gone to see my father, in spite of what you said. I am sure he would have believed me and come to see you. Then you could have convinced him, and I should not have this horrible grief of remembering that he had died without learning that his son was not a bad man, but was quite deserving of his affection. Jerome Fandor was making a brave struggle to maintain his self-control, and Juve looked at him without concealing the real sympathy he felt for him in his grief. He put his hand kindly on his shoulder. Listen, my dear boy, odd as you may think it, you can take my word for it that there is no need for you to despair. There is nothing to prove that your father is dead. He may or may not have been on board. The boy looked up in surprise. What do you mean, Juve? I don't want to say anything, my boy, except that you would be very wrong to give way to distress at present. If you have any confidence in me, you may believe me when I say that there is nothing yet to prove that you have had this loss, and besides, you still have your mother who is perfectly sure to get well. Do you understand? Perfectly sure. He changed the subject abruptly. There is one thing I should like to know. What the dickens brought you here? You were the first person I thought of in my trouble, Fandor replied. Directly I read about the disaster in that paper, I came to tell you at once. Yes, I quite understand that, Juve answered. What I do not understand is how you guessed that you would find me here in Gurn's flat. The question seemed to perturb the boy. It, it was quite by chance, he stammered. That is the kind of explanation one offers to fools, Juve retorted. By what chance did you see me come into this house? What the deuce were you doing in the Rue Le Vert? The lad showed some inclination to make for the door, but Juve stayed him peremptorily. Answer my question, please. How did you know I was here? Driven into a corner, the boy blurted out the truth. I had followed you. Followed me? Juve exclaimed. Where from? From your rooms. You mean, and you may as well own up to it at once, that you were shadowing me? Well, yes, Mr. Juve, it is true, Fandor confessed, all in one breath. I was shadowing you. I do every day. Juve was dumbfounded. Every day? And I never saw you? <laughs> Gad, you are jolly clever. And may I inquire why you have been exercising this supervision over me? Jerome Fandor hung his head. Forgive me, he faltered. I have been very stupid, 
I thought you... I thought you were Fantomas. The idea tickled the detective so much that he dropped back into a chair to laugh at his ease. Upon my word, he said, you have an imagination. And what made you suppose that I was Fantomas? Monsieur Juve, Fandor said earnestly, I made a vow that I would find out the truth and discover the scoundrel who has made such awful havoc of my life. But I did not know where to begin. From all you have said, I realize that Fantomas was a most extraordinarily clever man. I did not know anyone who could be cleverer than you, and so I watched you. It was merely logical. Far from being angry, Juve was rather flattered. I am amazed by what you have just told me, my boy, he said with a smile. In the first place, your reasoning is not at all bad. Of course, it is obvious that I cannot suspect myself of being Fantomas, but I quite admit that if I were in your place, I might make the supposition, wild as it may seem. And in the next place, you have shadowed me without my becoming aware of the fact, and that is very good indeed, a proof that you are uncommonly smart. He looked at the lad attentively for a few moments, and then went on more gravely. Are you satisfied now that your hypothesis was wrong, or do you still suspect me? No, I don't suspect you now, Fandor declared. Not since I saw you come into this house. Fantomas certainly would not have come to search Gurn's rooms because... He stopped, and Juve, who was looking at him keenly, did not make him finish what he was saying. Shall I tell you something, he said at last. If you continue to display as much thought and initiative in the career you have chosen as you have just displayed, you will very soon be a first newspaper detective of the day. He jumped up and led the boy off. Come along. I've got to go to the law courts at once. You found out something fresh? I'm going to ask them to call an interesting witness in the Gurn affair. Rain had been falling heavily all the morning and afternoon, but within the last few minutes it had almost stopped. Delon the steward put his hand out of the window and found that only a few drops were falling now from the heavy gray sky. He was an invaluable servant, and a few months after the death of the Marquis de Langrune, the Baron de Vibray had gladly offered him a situation and a cottage on her estate at Querel. He walked across the room and called his son. Jacques, would you like to come with me? I am going down to the river to see that the sluices have been opened properly. The banks are anything but sound, and these rains will flood us out one of these days. The steward and his son went down the garden towards the stream which formed one boundary of Madame de Vibray's park. Look, father, Jacques exclaimed, the postman is calling us. The postman, a crusty but good-hearted fellow, came hurrying up to the steward. You do make me run, Monsieur Delon, he complained. I went to your house this morning to take you a letter, but you weren't there. You might have left it with anybody. Excuse me, the man retorted. It's against the regulations. I've got an official letter for you, and I can only give it to you yourself and he held out an envelope which Delon tore open. Magistrate's office, he said inquiringly, as he glanced at the heading of the newspaper. Who can be writing to me from the law courts? He read the letter aloud. Sir, as time does not permit of a regular summons being sent to you by an usher of the court, I beg you to be so good as to come to Paris immediately, the day after tomorrow if possible, and attend at my office, where your depositions are absolutely required to conclude a case in which you are interested. Please bring, without exception, all the papers and documents entrusted to you by the clerk of assizes at Cahors at the conclusion of the Langrune inquiry. It is signed Germain Fusilier, Delon remarked. I have often seen his name in the papers. He is a very well-known magistrate and is employed in many criminal cases. He read the letter through once more, and turned to the postman. Will you take a glass of wine, Mueller? That's a thing I never say no to. Well, go into the house with Jacques, and while he is attending to you, I will reply. F and while he is attending to you, I will write a reply telegram which you can take to the office for me. While the man was quenching his thirst, Delon wrote his reply. We'll leave Verrières tomorrow evening by seven twenty train, arriving Paris five a.m. Wire appointment at your office to me at Hotel France Bourgeois, 152 Rue de Bach. 
He read the message over, signed it Dolon, and considered. I wonder what they can want me for. Oh, if only they have found out something about the Langrune affair, how glad I shall be! End of chapter 23 Recording by Alan Winteroud BoomCoach.blogspot.com